Hello, everyone. Um, it's always a nice sign to see the chat uh, window going with uh, the names and 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 uh, locations where everyone's joining us. So keep keep that going. And it's always lovely to see where everyone is. Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, hello um, for, for folks joining us. Thank you for for attending today. Uh, I'm very excited about about this talk. So without further ado, I'll I'll do sort of my uh, introductory duties and then turn, uh, turn it over to our uh, speakers today. So welcome to uh, the Herb LeBallon Lecture Series. Uh, today's presentation is called A Curtain Raiser for the Nebbiolo Story. My name is Alexander. I'm one of the instructors in the Type Cooper uh, uh, program, which is presenting today's talk. Uh, for those who may not be familiar with Type Cooper, we are a postgraduate certificate program in typeface design uh, here at Cooper Union. Um, the program has a dedicated lecture series uh, that we've had since the first year of the program. Uh, so this is a lecture within that lecture series that is uh, annual and usually consists of 12 lectures a year. So we're about, uh, uh, we're closing out, uh, about to close out the, the second half. So we're a little bit more than halfway through that program when we have five more lectures coming up in this like academic year. Um, Type Cooper also uh, offers, besides the certificate program, offers a lot of type design, lettering, uh, typography related workshops. Uh, we also organize Typographics Conference, which will be happening again this year, uh, virtually in 2021. So look out for announcements about that, which will be coming soon. Um, and you can find more information about the program on our website. And I will post that uh, in the chat. I'll try to do that as much as I can as we go. Um, so we have uh, one more lecture coming up, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in, in this kind of a spring cycle of Type Cooper lecture series. Um, the next lecture that's coming up is next Monday, so a week away from now. Uh, it's going to be at 6.30 New York time, and the presenter uh, next week on, on April 5th is going to be Peter Bain. Uh, Peter Bain is going to give a talk called Rendering 25 Years, and Peter is going to give a talk about um, his uh, view of uh, lettering instruction uh, books in the United States during that 25 year period from about 1945 to about 1970, uh, kind of looking at uh, what they contain and what we can uh, learn from those books. So it should be a really interesting look at uh, the evolution of instruction of lettering in the United States, very, kind of very much like commercial lettering. Um, so register for that talk if you haven't already. Um, the lecture is posted here. I uh, just put it in the chat. Um, you can find the uh, details for registration there. We also have a very extensive video archive of talks going back five, six years now. And to see all of them, uh, you can go to our webpage to the same link I just posted. Um, and if you go into the previous lectures, you can click on the lecture and the videos are embedded in there. You can also go to our Vimeo account, um, which uh, has all of the lectures posted in there. And I'm gonna post that chat as well. Um, and this talk is being recorded as well. Uh, and it will be published as soon as the, the editing is put together, which is probably in a couple of weeks. So if you wanted to watch this uh, lecture again, it will be available and will be available at exactly the same space. Um, and just a couple of housekeeping, really quick housekeeping notes. Um, so uh, this is a webinar, so your video is off and your audio is off, and so there's no need to mute yourself. Um, and you know, uh, chat is 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 a way to um, uh, talk to us and talk to to everyone in attendance. But if you have questions for the uh, speakers today, use the Q and A function. Uh, we will be reading, taking questions from that. So. We'll try to make sure we catch a question that might pop up in the chat, but it's much better to send it through the Q&A. Um, a really quick note about the video quality. We're kind of at the mercy of Zoom and that the internet on many different levels where we're broadcasting from, where you're receiving the video feed. So we apologize if there's any glitches in, in the video feed. We kind of do the best we can, but sometimes things just uh, are the way they are. The archive recording will be as smooth as we can. We're doing multiple kind of recordings that will, can be uh, uh, synced just in case. So if there's anything that uh, is, is not of the best quality, rest assured the quality of the video recording will be much, much better. 
Um, and one other small thing, um, it's just the quirks of Zoom uh, chat. In the Zoom chat, make sure that you're, when you're posting something, there's a toggle that says two panelists and attendees. Make sure that you're sending it instead of panelists, two panelists and attendees, if you wanted to chat with, with everyone in, in the group. Um, otherwise, the panelists is just uh, who we are, and for that, um, use the Q&A function as well. So without further ado, I will introduce today's uh, speakers, and I will turn it over to them. Um, we have with us today Martha Bernstein, uh, James Clough, uh, Alessandra Colizzi, and Ricardo Oloco. Uh, and I will give you very quick, uh, short introductions and, and give everyone uh, time to uh, engage with, with the talks. Uh, uh, the first presenter is Martha Bernstein. Uh, she is a designer, researcher, teacher, and co-founder of the Digital Type Foundry Cast. Uh, type and typography are her true passions and the common thread throughout all her projects. The next presenter is James Clough. James moved to London, from London to Milan in 1971 and pursued a career in typography and calligraphy. He lectures and writes on history of typography and the graphic arts. Um, Alessandra Colizzi is an associate professor of design at the Politecnico di Milano. He researches and teaches graphic design history, typography, and type design. And Ricardo Loco is a designer and researcher, visiting research fellow at the University of Reading. He is a member and a co-founder of CAST as well. So I will turn it over to Marta first, who will uh, present her part of the story. Thank you, Marta, and thank you, everyone. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here. So my job today is to walk you through Nebbiolo early years, so roughly the first 50 years of the story of the company, which is actually the story of two companies. Um, you can see here in this illustration from 1930 uh, on Archivio Tipografico, that was the magazine that Nebbiolo issued for um, uh, many decades. Uh, in this illustration, you can see that there are actually two streams that are creating the Nebbiolo story, the Nebbiolo River. So I'll try to talk about the one on the left that you see that is the Nebbiolo one, the one on the right that is the Comoretti Urania one that is uh, usually the one that is the most overlooked. And what happened when the two of them joined together in the Augusta company in 1908? and what will happen till the early uh, 1920s when Alessandro will take over from me. Uh, a couple of uh, words on my research. Uh, it's mostly on primary sources, so that's why there aren't many books written on this um, period of time for Nebbiolo. I'm trying to map all the Italian type foundries that ended up being part of the Nebbiolo itself. Uh, how many survived specimen are available. So also if you own a specimen of an Italian type foundry, please be in touch and try to identify where the typefaces are from because none of those designs were originally from Italy. So let's start our journey with the Nebbiolo side of the screen. Um, it started in 1852 with a small local foundry called Narizzano in Turin. Um, you have to remember that moving metal type around was extremely difficult. So type founding has been a local business for a very long time. Uh, that's why many, uh, there was a foundry in basically every Italian city, even though the quality was not the best. Um, then in 1878, Giovanni Nebbiolo bought Narizzano. It was a small foundry with just a few workers. Uh, he ran the company under the name Narizzano for a couple of years. Then he realized he needed a partner with some money that would help him expand the company. And that's uh, when on June 13th, 1880, Giovanni Nebbiolo, together with Lazzaro Levi, they form a temporary company, a temporary partnership that is the beginning of the story of Nebbiolo. Uh, Giovanni Nebbiolo would own two thirds of the company, uh, contributing with 40,000 liters of equipment, and Lazzaro Levi will contribute with 25,000 liters of capital money. Um, 
Nebbiolo is growing fast in this advertising from um, 1886. We can see that uh, Nebbiolo had a branch in Rome and one in Buenos Aires, besides the main factory in Turin, and representatives throughout Italy. Um, eight years after the foundation, the partnership, it's not temporary anymore, it becomes uh, an actual uh, partnership with much larger capital and more partners. Uh, the two founding one, Giovanni Nebbiolo and Lazzaro Levi, and Lazzaro's brother, Giuseppe Levi. He will be important because he will be the head of sales for a very long time. And you can see in this uh, illustration here, the first Nebbiolo factory. One year later, Nebbiolo starts uh, issuing Archivio Tipografico. It was a magazine for the printing industry uh, with a lot of technical art articles to instruct um, printers throughout Italy, keep them updated with new technology and what was happening in the field. It was art directed by Dalmazzo Gianolio uh, from the foundation till 1915. Uh, Archivio Tipografico is extremely important for our research because it's telling the story of the company, but also um, displaying like the spread that you see here which typefaces Nebbiolo wanted to advertise and when they were advertised. So it's good also for um, starting to build a story. Uh, there are no specimen left of the very first early years, but there are some specimens that uh, were made by binding together some of the spreads that were used for Archivio, Archivio Tipografico, like the one that you see here, bound together in one of the first specimens. We can see that Nebbiolo production, of course, remember that none of these designs were original. Um, Nebbiolo was selling text typefaces, display typefaces, and a lot of borders and decoration that made the company specifically known. Um, just a quick question, and where, uh, where were the typefaces from? So since none of these were original designs, we know that Nebbiolo had contacts with German type foundries and also with American ones. Uh, I chose to show you just one uh, advertising page from Archivio Tipografico that is displaying together three typefaces that were original design of the McKellar, Smith and Jordan, the type foundry uh, in Philadelphia in the US. Uh, this page is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first one is that the typeface on top that Nebbiolo was selling as crayon is exactly the same name that it had in the original American, type, uh, American foundry. And the one on the bottom called originally Stipple was designed in 1890. And in 1891, it's already appearing on uh, Archivio Tipografico, meaning that there was probably a strong connection uh, with, uh, that Nebbiolo had with American type foundries. Moving on with the, sto uh, with the story, Nebbiolo is getting bigger. In 1899, uh, it becomes a shared partnership, 2 million liras capital is really getting bigger and it's acquiring Riper. It's not the only type foundry that Nebbiolo acquired, but it's the most renowned one. Riper was a very, one of the best Italian type foundries. And it's the only one that Nebbiolo is advertising on Archivio Tipografico itself that you can see on the right, that it's now part of Nebbiolo. Uh, there's only one type specimen that survived of this type foundry from 1881. And it's an extremely beautiful one, very nicely printed. Uh, of course, none of these designs were original, but the quality of type must have been pretty high because of the um, quality of the imprint. So turning off the century, let's focus on the other side of the stream, the Comoretti Urania one. Uh, like Narizzano, Comoretti was a local foundry in Milan, started in 1880, uh, sorry, 1838. Uh, it grew uh, during the century, it became one of the main ones uh, in Milan. Uh, and we can see in an advertising from 1890, uh, sorry, uh, 1901, that the company uh, now had an engraving studio, meaning that they were now able to design original typefaces, uh, meaning that everything that they did so far 
was not original, of course. But Comoretti is becoming a large player. Like Nebbiolo, they were also manufacturing printing presses. Um, uh, 1903, Comoretti changes name to Urania. We have a specimen here that can tell you what was the usual look of a specimen in the turn of the 20th century, a mix of very or older design and more contemporary ones, display and text typefaces. Um, again, none of these designs were original. Uh, and we can read uh, Raffaello Bertieri's opinion on what was the Italian production uh, regarding typefaces. So Raffaello Bertieri, it's important because he will later become our director at Nebbiolo. Um, and uh, on his magazine called Risorgimento Grafico, meaning the renaissance of the graphic arts, he is complaining that Italian type foundries are just selling American typefaces instead of working to create a truly Italian type inspired by the story of Italian art. This is important because this point of view will influence what Nebbiolo will publish after World War I. So what is happening with Urania and why it's so important? In 1906, the Urania Trust um, is started. It's a merge of, led by Urania, by um, nine more local foundries. Uh, you can see in this advertising here, it's the only source that I've found that it's listing all of them properly. So mainly from Milan, but also Bologna, Rome, and Florence. Um, this is similar to what happened in the US with ATF, American type founders, uh, a couple of decades earlier, actually, where, where many foundries agreed to merge to stop destructive um, um, to stop to having a uh, destructive competition and join forces because the market of course was changing. So with uh, the birth of the Urania Trust, uh, Urania becomes the largest player in Italy. It had a larger capital than Nebbiolo, uh, factories in Milan, Bologna and Florence, so spread out um, inside uh, across Italy. Uh, and the influence of Urania will stay for a long time in Nebbiolo, because Lovetti Bodoni, that was the general director of Urania, will then later become the general director of Nebbiolo itself. And Angelo Albe, that was the owner of one of the local foundries that merged into Urania Trust, will later be the technical director of the type foundry department at Nebbiolo. Um, in 1906, Urania was a major player. We know it was not only producing metal type, but also wood type. And it had uh, an engraving office for matrices. Um, there was a national exposition in Milan, exhibition in 1906. And you can see that Urania is stretching their muscles to be ready to go after Nebbiolo. Um, it's a very large stand there displaying machines and typefaces with the names that can be read like Ricordi and Treves that were two of the largest and higher quality publishers in Milan at that time. But what happens next? In 1908, the two companies decide to stop being competitors and to join force under the name of Augusta. That will be a holding company of the two separate companies uh, selling their products under the name of Augusta with two general, man uh, general director, Lazzaro Levi from Nebbiolo, one of the original founders, and Lobetti Bodoni. That was uh, a relative of uh, Giambattista Bodoni itself. It's funny how the story of Italy, uh, <laughs> the same names come, keep coming out. Uh, speaking of Bodoni, it was under the name of Augusta that the company acquired the rights for the ATF Bodoni designed by Morris Fuller Benton. Uh, it was acquired for the anniversary of the hundred years of death, uh, anniversary of the death of Bodoni in 1913. Um, there's a funny story there that they're saying 
uh, of course, it's official, it's, it's said in Archivio Tipografico, there's a mention of ATF, and they're saying that they didn't want to copy them, so they would sell, uh, they would acquire the rights of uh, the matrices. Augusta was expanding also abroad, um, Central and South America were its largest market abroad, but then World War I starts. It's a big hit on Augusta. Um, it, everything stops. And after the war is over in 1918, uh, all the stakeholders of Augusta decide for an official merge. So it was not a holding anymore. Uh, the Nebbiolo and Comp uh, company is born. It will take two years uh, for the company to fully recover and issue the first type specimen in 1920. Uh, you can see here a detail of the cover uh, that though it's, uh, it's mentioning the Nambiolo name only on the cover, everything inside is still mentioning Augusta because they didn't have time to set again all the pages of the specimen. And inside is of course uh, in Conabula, the typeface designed by Raffaello Bertieri originally in 1911 and acquired by Augusta. Uh, Bertieri is now the art director of Nebbiolo. Um, and the influence is, it's there, it's very visible in the choice of the typefaces that are produced on, in, under his vision and also the typefaces that he himself designs for the company. So in Conabula is the first typeface uh, that is uh, advertised when Archivio Tipografico in 1923 starts um, publishing again. Um, another typeface by Bertieri called Ruano based on the uh, handwriting of the Vatican calligrapher Ferdinando Ruano is issued. And you can see that there's the inference of Bertieri and this vision that I mentioned a few slides ago going back to the story of Italy and uh, Italian art to be inspired to create new typeface. It's something that that was sort of um, the main direction at Nebbiolo at that time. But then in 1928, something happens. Uh, a different, there's a different direction in the layout of Archivio Tipografico. We think that probably Giulia da Milano was the new art director because you can see from the covers that the style from when Bertieri was creative director after 1928, Bertieri is still working at the Biolo, but the style is completely different. It's much more modernist, much more rationalist. Uh, they look completely different. So I will... Um, pass the baton to Alessandro to, uh, to keep on telling the story of Nebbiolo and who Giulio da Milano was. Um, my part is over. So story of Urania and Nebbiolo and what happened from now on is on to Alessandro Polizzi. Thank you. Thank you. Just a second, allow for some shift. Um... Yes, can you see the full screen slide? I guess so. So um, thank you, Marta, and let's get on with the story. <clears throat> the origins of the Nebbiolos are stu uh, Studio Artistico, or Art Studio in English, but Studio Artistico are still shrouded in contradictory references. The current opinion is that the studio was established in 1933 and entrusted to Giulio da Milano, under whose direction the foundry released modern typefaces such as Simplicità, Neon, Veltro, and Razionale. In 1936, wait a minute. In 1936, da Milano was succeeded by his uh, uh, collaborator Alessandro Butti, who would sign faces such as Fluidum, Quirinus, Augustea, Microgramma, Recta. 
And when Buti was made redundant in 1952, Aldo Novarese remained firmly on board as artistic director until his retirement in 1972. In turn, Novarese designed original faces such as Geraldus, Egizio, Slogan, Estro, and Stop. Thus, the studio output over several decades focused more on display than continuous text typefaces, addressing the needs of the press and the growing ad advertising industry. This is usually explained by the nature of Nebbiolo customers, mostly small and medium-sized printing firms. In reality, these are the late chapters of a longer story, which dates back to, to the turn of the century, if not slightly earlier. In fact, considering the number of original and successful text and display typefaces released by the foundry since the 1890s, it seems unlikely that such an output was happenstance or random. A close reading of information scattered in archival sources offers some clues to at least partially solving the puzzle. By retracing these early steps, I would like in the first place to shed some light on the role played by lesser known figures, such as Dalmazzo Gianolio, Edoardo Cotti and Raffaello Bertieri before discussing Giulio da Milano's stint as studio art director. As Marta has shown, the company began its expansion in 1878 as a foundry of stereotype faces. Their catalog was largely made up of Art Nouveau display type faces, cast from matrices probably acquired from German and French foundries, fleurons, borders, ornaments, vignettes produced by stereotyping and electroplating, and coppers and brasses. In the late 1880s, Nebbiolo's activities expanded to the sale of French and British printing presses and accessories, Marinoni, Furnival, L'Hermite, Monotype. And within a few years, the company began manufacturing their own models of printing presses, whose mechanical reliability would soon set the products on a par with foreign competitors. As early as 1889, Nebbiolo launched a technical uh, journal devoted to the printing arts, titled Archivio uh, Typografico. The publication was an almost instant success and soon doubled with French and Spanish editions, with a print run of up to 12,000 copies to be distributed to clients in Italy and abroad. Its editor-in-chief was Dalmazzo Gianolio, who was the foreman of the in-house printing department. The publication was impeccably produced with colorful covers and inserts, featured articles addressing technicalities, news, more general topics related to the art of printing, as well as carefully crafted composition samples and type specimens displaying Nebbiolo's latest releases and adverts, of course. In his double role as foreman and editor-in-chief, Gianolio earned much respect from, from, from the trade community. And it's no surprise that in 1902, he was appointed director to the newly, newly established Regia Scuola Tipografica Biliar di Paravia, National School of Typography, one of the earliest uh, professional schools for the printing trade in Italy. Sometime around 1898, a photomechanical engraving studio was established in-house to produce artistic zinc, copper, and wood engravings, as well as pu pu publicity signs. The studio was supervised by the painter Edoardo Cotti, um, an artist who designed all sorts of Art Nouveau vignettes and ornaments, as well as cover illustrations and advertisements for Archivio. We suspect that the photo engraving studio supervised by Cotti likely constituted the core of the drawing office in charge of the research and design of new alphabets. Cotti also taught at the Regia Scuola, headed by Gianolio, and in 1917, the school published Cotti's book on the origin of the alphabet, Origine della scrittura e derivazione morfologica dell'alfabeto, which also points to his remarkable lettering and drawing skills. Not surprisingly, in 1926, Cotti designed the typeface known as Pastonchi, cut by the Monotype Corporation in 1928 for the publisher Mondadori. 
Information about the company's internal organization at the turn of the century is scant, but it is reasonable to assume that in 19, what in 1928 would be referred to as the technical department had been established around 1915 and possibly entrusted to Dalmazzo Gianolio. And now to Raffaello Bertier. From the 1910s, um, Nebbiolo began releasing some outstanding revivals based on historical models, as we have seen, notably Jensen, released in 1911, and Bodoni, licensed from ATF in 1913. When Gianolio passed away in 1926, printer scholar Raffaello Bertieri took over the role of artistic consultant to the foundry. Bertieri, who ran a successful business, a printing business in Milan, uh, as Bertieri and Vanoletti, later Istituto Bertieri, and was the editor of the printing arts journal Risorgimento Grafico, initiated a revival program, so to speak, based on early Renaissance models, which led to the release of original typefaces such as Incunabula, Ruano, uh, pa pa Paganini, and Sinibaldi, which strengthened Nebbiolo's reputation for text typefaces too. But the cultural climate in Italy was ripe for a renewal. Over just a few months in 1930, 1933 saw the debut of the modernist monthly Campografico, echoed by the new uh, Casabella, remodeled by Edoardo Persico with Guido Modiano. At the fifth triennale, the German Werkbund exhibition curated by Paul Renner was met with great acclaim and Antonio Buggeri opened his eponymous advertising studio where foreign designers such as Imre Reiner, Xanti Shavinsky, Max Huber were able to update the local graphic culture. There was enough going on to spark a lively debate amongst uh, the pr pr practitioners in typography, in architecture, photography and art. This major stylistic change was also reflected in the graphic layout of Archivio, which is clearly visible from 1928 onwards. Considering that the publication ceased in 1933, when the Milano was appointed artistic director to the uh, Studio Artistico, it seems most likely that the Milano was in charge of the editorial teamwork behind the journal. The appointment of Giulio da Milano in 1933 signaled a new phase for Nebbiolo typefaces marked by highly, typo, uh, highly modern typographic creations that were a far cry from Bertieri's philological orientations and which proved highly influential. Under his short stint as head of the creative department, aptly renamed Studio Artistico, da Milano launched new rationalist and highly successful typefaces such as Semplicità, Neon, Vetro, and Razionale. Let's have a look at them. This is an overview of the most recent original typefaces released by Nebbiolo in the early 30s. Simplicita is a geometric type family that fit the zeitgeist of the 1920s. It was released in 1928 and proved so successful as to remain in the foundry catalog until its demise in the 1970s. Unfairly considered to be an Italian copy of Futura, its capitals are closed with a few liberties to Roman classical pro pro proportions, while the lower case is reminiscent of our nouveau letter forms. This testifies to Da Milano's original line of thought, as proved by its early release date, considering an average time frame of approximately two years from research to full uh, man manufacture. It seems unlikely that it was based directly on Renner's design, although it does bear a number of similarities in the lower case, mostly. Neon, and not neon, in Italian is neon. Neon is a geometric monocase sans serif. Designed by Da Milano and released by Nebbiolo in 1933, neon was very popular in advertising in Italy throughout the 1930s. It was quite an original experiment as it not only mixed cases, but was designed and produced in a size range from six to 72 points, each size with um, uh, progressively narrower uh, pro pro proportions um, as the size increased. The family consisted of two contrasting weights, light and bold, plus a shaded titling version. In its microscopic version owes perhaps something to the quadrate idea of Alessandro Butti's microgramma, but for that later. 
Nairn was also so successful that for once, German foundries copied it. This is uh, an example of Maximum released by the Schriftgust Dresden in 1939, which is clearly a ripoff of Nairn. Veltro, although Veltro was influenced by the journal script Signal released by Berthold in 1931, it responded to the popular trend of script typefaces of the 1930s and remained a staple face for jobbing printers well into the 1950s. It is distinguished by a low contrast stroke and quoting Riccardo De Franceschi, this face can be interpreted as the script counterpart of Nebbiolo's geometric sans serif Semplicita and slab serif Landi, which they were often combined with in practice. Then we have Fregio Meccano and Fregio Razionale, both released around 1935. Practically nothing is known about these geometrical modular type faces, uh, which are a kind of weird experiment where the typographer was supposed to combine these bits of, of lead elements into letter forms freely, which was really amazing and way ahead of its time. This is Meccano and this is Razionale. Damiano should also be credited with a new index system, which came into use around 1935 or, or, or slightly earlier. The previous uh, indexing system assigned a progressive number to each new series, which must have proved increasingly confusing as the catalog kept expanding. So in the early 1930s, many old type families no longer commercially viable were removed from the catalog and the last catalog using this system dates from 1928 in four volumes. When the new one appeared in 1935, Campionario Caratteri e Fregi Tipografici, it used a new indexing system. Each typeface is assigned a unique code made of three numbers, a three-digit code indicating the type family, a two-digit code indicating the weight, width, or style, plus a number referring to the body size. Although we do not know for sure whether the new system was directly devised by Da Milano, possibly in collaboration with the commercial department, it seems very likely that he was at least fully involved. It is also during his tenure at the Studio Artistico that the foundry began the regular pu publication of single specimens for type families instead of uh, bulky catalogs, um, a promotional strategy that would be would be further developed by his successors, Alexandro Butti and uh, Aldo Novarese. And it was probably Da Milano too who introduced the progressive numbering systems for each printed matter, starting around 1935-36. It should also be noted that the Studio Artistico was not in charge only of developing new alphabets, but also of designing all printed matter for the whole company, including the printing presses factory. These items ranged from type specimens, catalogs, to product leaflets, technical booklets, advertisements, mailing cards, you name it. Damiano was a painter, a graphic designer, and a teacher. He had studied at the Academia Albertina and devoted himself to painting. In 1931, he was a founding member of the avant-garde group Issei, with Carlo Levi and Gigi Case, among others, where he met Edoardo Persico before he moved to Milan. He was also passionate about the graphic arts, in particular book illustration, woodcuts, lithography, and he taught at the Regia Scuola uh, Tipografica and later, uh, after 1945, at the Instituto di Arti Grafiche. Thus, we can say that Giulio da Milano showed a rare insight and ability to lead the way, if not anticipate the most modern trends. He left an important and lasting creative and organizational imprint at Nebbiolo Studio Artistico, one that his successor, Alessandro Butti, will bring to full fruition. Thank you. Okay, I will share my screen. Thank you, Alessandro. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. 
So, hello everybody. I'm starting from the point where Alessandro stopped. So, in uh, in 1936, Giulio da Milano resigned, and Butti replaced him as director of the Studio Artistico. We have not found yet good pictures of Alessandro Butti. I'm showing here the few we have acquired, which were gathered by Enrico Tallone, who kindly let us reproduce them. Butti is always a character in the background. He's never in the center of a picture. And this probably reflects his nature. It seemed to me clear that he didn't have a big ego or unlike others who came after him. This is a group photo of a type founding department and Butti is the second from the left. Here a close up. Butti's biographical information is also scanty. We know very little of him. We know that he was born in 1893 in Casalnoceto in the province of Alessandria that is not far from Turin. And it's not clear where he studied and how he got involved in typography. However, in 1916, he won an award in Turin for designing an album of alphabets. And in the following years, he designed several covers for the graphic periodical Graphicus. Here you see some typesetting exercise that was done by Butti when he was a student. He entered Nebbiolo in 1911. But we don't know in which department he started. By the 20s, anyway, he was working in the in-house in in printing office, where the company specimen and catalogs were designed and printed, and where also Archivio Typographico was designed and printed. So in 1936, Butti became director of the Studio Artistico. And in the following 60 years, 16 years under his direction, Nebbiolo released about a dozen new type families. But as stressed by Enrico Tallone, these type families shaped the history of Italian 20th century printing. From some unpublished documents, we can reconstruct the work in the Studio Artistico under Butti's direction. Butti had three assistants. Their usual task was to draft with Indian ink the letter forms that Butti drew in pencil. Butti was very strict and nitpicking. He used to check all the drafts and the work often had to be corrected with white gouge, but sometimes the entire letter was done again from scratch. You see Butti here, it's the last on the right. After that letters, numerals and punctuation were completed, the finished drawings were photographed and printed at different sizes. The sample was spaced and then checked very carefully to detect and correct inaccuracies. Butti was extremely precise and he had a tendency to correct his work over and over again. It seems that most of his design that were produced as type took several years to develop, up to 10 years or more. Here we see some frames of an old video that was taken in the end of the 40s explaining the work in Nebbiolo and showing here Butti in the Studio Artistico going around uh, his assistant. You can see in the third row, the second from the left, you can see this uh, with the kind of Elvis style of haircut. That is the young, a young Aldo Novarese. So after this very brief introduction, let's have a, a quick look at some of the most popular types produced under Butti's direction. The first type I'm going to show is Fluidum, released in 1937. Fluidum is a high contrast script face with a strongly standardized design that only remotely resembles its calligraphic model, which was probably the copper plate script. The spontaneity and the organic quality of calligraphy have completely disappeared in Fluidum. However, the typeface seems to reproduce some features of a point and nib, such as the thin, delicate exit strokes, which, however, never connect with the following letter, as you can see, and the stroke modulation with sudden transition between thick and thin strokes in the curves. Pretty modern. 
Our friend and colleague Riccardo De Franceschi, that was mentioned by Alessandro, Riccardo has undertaken a research project on 20th, of 20th century script faces that he calls script amanent. He is a partner in the Nebbiolo history project and, uh, and he has analyzed several Nebbiolo script faces, including fluidum. He noted that the construction of fluidum is cursive and most of the letters are made of one continuous line, leading to powerful solution for some of them. See, for instance, capital F or also capital G, but also lowercase n and m, for instance. They give to the typhus its distinct look. As the name describes it, the design is pretty fluid. Here you see the, the, the serinera, that means black, that, that was flu, fluidum bold, released in the same year. In the same 1937, Nebbiolo published Nebula released uh, Resolute, a sans serif stencil type with a peculiar look. The letters are sloped. The capitals display a geometrical construction with, re a re with a repetition of a small group of basic elements, while the lowercase seems to mimic the cursive style, as you can see, for instance, uh, in lowercase e, in lowercase s, and especially in lowercase o, with its peculiar swelling on the, rap on the right up upper right corner, which recalls the twirl of an exit stroke. A peculiar aspect of Resolute is that in the Biolo specimen and catalogs, this type is, is uh, often attributed to one Hans Brunnen. And this is the only case among all Nebbiolo typefaces because Nebbiolo typefaces are always attributed to the director of the Studio Artistico, which was Buti first and later Novarese. So this is the only case when we have a name, the name of a designer, apparently, on, on, on a typeface. Perhaps Brunel designed this typeface on its own and later offered it to Buti, who reviewed it and published it. We don't have any information at all we know, we just know that Brunel was a German designer, but despite some research on the matter, we have found no information at all on this guy. If anyone has information on Hans Brunel, please contact me. I would be very, very grateful. The next type phase is Landy Echo, an old caps display companion of the Landy family. Landy family was mentioned by Alessandro. Landy was a slab serif released in the early 1930s before the establishment of the Studio Artistico, probably under Da Milano's direction. And Landy closely resembles Ludwig and Meyer's Welt Antiqua that was published, that was released a few, one or two years earlier. Landy Echo was released in 1939. Here, Buti overlaid Landy Light Italic on Landy Roman bold in negative format to obtain uh, in this new striking uh, and dynamic type, very suitable for commercial use. And now Quirinus, released in the same year, 1939. Here you see the cover of the first specimen. As Buti claimed, in, in, in the, the specimen of Quirinus, uh, this type is the contemporary interpretation, I mean, contemporary in the late 30s, of course, the contemporary interpretation of the modern neoclassical genre. Buti spends the name of Bodoni and links the shape of Quirinus to current decorative and architect architectural trends. There are a few details in the design of this type that I'd like to point out. First of all, the round letter forms are heavily squarish, and they anticipate what we can see some what we see some decades later in microgram and Eurostile. You see all the round are very squarish. Moreover, letters, letters with oblique strokes, such as capital A and V and W, or lowercase V and W, they all display a generous rounded apex like that we find in the same letters of the neon type family, which Alessandro has just introduced. Moreover, Quirinus displays thin serifs with minimal bracketing, 
like in contemporary revivals so of modern faces. Think just, for instance, of Bento's ATF Bodoni that we saw before. However, neither ascendants nor descendants displace serifs at the end of the strokes. Here you see the bold style of Quirinus, released in the same year. Tallone collected uh, some photographic proofs of Quirinus, made in 1938, where some of the letter forms are not those that were produced. We can see that the counters of A, age, and U appear closed because the serif touch each other. This is not the same of the final release of Quirinus. Finally, I would like to spend a few words on Recta, a sans serif that was released in the late 1950s after Butti was dismissed. Butti's layoff took place in 1952 when he was 58 years old. And uh, in 1952, the company had run into financial difficulties and several employees were made redundant. So Recta was released under, under Novarese direction in 58 as a family with several width and weight variants, much like Universe, which had been released in the previous year. Indeed, the Recta has always been seen as Nebbiolo's answer to Universe and, to universe and Helvetica. But from unpublished documents, we know that while its Italian companion and all the other styles were later added by Novarese, Butti had designed the original Recta Roman before being dismissed in 1952. We have to remember that Helvetica and Universe were released in 1957. Butti had been working in a similar vein several years in advance, which gives an idea of how he was able to anticipate certain trends. Because it was only after the mid-1950s, with the popularity of Swiss graphic design and the increasing use of arts and grotesque, that the major founders decided to release modern interpretation of 19th century sans serifs. Butti was not credited for Recta original design, and so type historians could not give Butti the recognition he deserved. Now, after this brief overview of Butti's work, I would like to spend the remaining time with what I consider Butti's masterpiece, Augustea, a revival of imperial Roman inscriptional capitals. Augustea was released in 1949, but the project started some years earlier, around 46, as Butti recalled in a talk he gave at Lesser and Conte de Lourdes. This, this talk was later published in Caractère, Maximilian Vogt's famous magazine. Here you see the first page of the article, the opening of the article. From this article, we can follow the inception of the project and the design method which was followed for Augustea. It started with a scholarly trip to central Italy, where Butti and his assistant went scouting for surviving Roman inscriptions and fragments. Based on this research, Butti concluded that the Roman capitals reached their best execution during the time between the emperors Augustus and Trajan, between the third decade after Christ and the beginning of the following century. This conclusion was based on their observation. Thus, they chose about a hundred monuments built during this time. They were public buildings, but also funerary steels, tombstones, votive stones, and other fragments. And they photographed them. Out of this photographic material, they selected the best letter forms and designed them on paper, following the original details and proportions. This lead, led to a first trial of more than 250 letter forms, where all the letters had several alternative shapes. Butin and his assistants ran many tests, combining the different shapes with one another, and finally picked up the most striking samples. Butti chose a letter R with straight, with straight tail and subtle twill on its end. And he chose also letters M and N with no serifs on top, as 40 years later, Carol Twombly did in a Trajan typeface that everybody knows very well. However, unlike Trajan, which you see here below, Augustus M and N do not finish with the sharp apexes. They look like more like broken off stems. And to me, they better integrate with the rest of the letters. The proportions are obviously imperial, while the serifs are prominent for the triangular shapes, unlike in Trajan, where they are almost flat. 
they are subtly bracketed, and to me, they are still today, they still stand today as a suburb interpretation of classical Roman serifs. The stroke modulation is soft. There is some thick and thin contrast. However, the letter forms are somewhat light, slightly lighter than Trajan letter forms. Soon after its inception, Augustea Filetata was issued as a companion. It shows a treatment that mimics the three-dimensional effect of inscriptional capitals. The workflow of Butis Augustea looks pretty modern. It's based on photographic documents of original models, on their analysis, on their design of alternative shapes, and on their testing and trials. It's similar to the workflow followed, for instance, in the Adobe Revivals, or for instance, in ITC Bodoni and many others, including myself and many colleagues and friends who have designed digital revivals of historical type. Here you see some frames from a video where, Bodoni, where Nebbiolo shows the Augustea workflow. The photographer you see here is Alessandro Butti. I would like to conclude this Oh, short overview with an item that is included into Enrico Stallone collection, and Enrico kindly allowed us to reproduce. It's the layout of an unpublished specimen that Booty designed around 1950, but it was never printed. It's a trial made by hands with photographic reproduction of letters and colored with airbrush and gauge. Here we can see that Booty designed a lowercase companion to Augustia, to Augustia, with a single story A and the overall generous proportions. Another trial version of this lowercase with some letters that follow a different shape was prepared around 1951. It survived in some unpublished documents collected by Talona and today at the Tipoteca of Cornuda. In 1964, this type design was eventually released as Nova Augustea, signed by Novarese, who was at the time the type director of Nebbiolo. Novarese made some improvements on Butti's original lowercase design. And, however, he did not credit Butti. Thank you. And now I hand over to James, who will introduce Gramma and Eurostila. Thank you. You can hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, good. Um, oh, God, so why can't I get full, full screen here? Why is that? Um, hold on. Condivido is scale mode. Okay. There we are. Is that okay? I'll get yes, that. just full screen for us. Full screen. Full screen. Start. Uh, why can't it? Doesn't give me full screen. I can't understand that. Full screen. No, it won't give me full screen. James, control L. Control L. Huh. Yeah, it doesn't do anything either. Uh, it won't give me full screen, and I've never had that before. I don't know why. When I could try Command L, maybe? Command L. L, yeah, and that doesn't work either. Uh, would that be all right? Or James, you need to... Unshare the screen, make it full screen, your PDF, and then you share the screen. Ah, okay, yeah, all right, okay, full screen. Uh, Vista. Yeah, and it still won't allow me to get uh, into uh, full screen. I'll have to get out of it. Someone in the chat suggested X out of that menu on the right. On the right, Vista. No. So, ah, schermo intero. Okay, is that it? No. No. Yes. Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, that's what I have to do. I've got it. Okay, I think I've got it now. Just hang on a moment. Condivido schermo intero. Desktop. 
and delete it. Oh dear, what's happened to it? It's gone away. Oh hell. Uh Condi was on a scale mind tail. Is this it? Can yes. you see that? Can you see that? Yes, we can. Oh, yes, no, we can. Okay, sorry about those um, technical hitches. Um, 150 years of microgramma and Euro Um Some of you might be a bit perplexed by that title, uh, but I'll, I'll explain everything later on in the talk. Um, in uh, just a word about the name, the two names, uh, uh, in Italian, it's microgramma and aerostile. Of course, if your um, English is mother tongue, it would be microgramma and euro style. Um, I, I might lapse into uh, both of these uh, pronunciations during my talk, and I apologize for that. Um, here we have uh, the, uh, the two typefaces together. Uh, and I thank, sincerely thank Sandra Berra and the Tipoteca for this photo. Uh, you can see uh, on the left microgra microgramma, it's a, um, a, full, a full face on the body. It's a titling, uh, caps only. Whereas Aerostile, which came in 10 years after um, uh, microgramma was released, you can see the uh, the shoulders are empty uh, for the lowercase descenders. Well, here's the here's the uh, um, here are the five different styles that um, Alessandro Buti designed for um, for uh, microgramma. Uh, which was released in 1952. Novarese had a part in it, but I think it was only as a draftsman and not as a designer. Um, here we see uh, under under the condensed under the uh, they've got it wrong here. That's not condensed. That's uh, obviously ex, uh, uh, ex extended. Um, the condensed would be this one. They've got it the wrong way round. Uh, however, in the six point sizes in uh, in uh, mi um, microgramma. They have uh, up to three or four different letter sizes on the, on the body, uh, and that allowed um, that allowed um, uh, caps and small caps in maybe two different versions, uh, which is quite interesting. It wasn't actually an invention by Nebbiolo because uh, at the beginning of the twentieth century, uh, ATF's copper plate Gothic had the same idea. Uh, four different letter sizes or for six point bodies. Uh, and uh, I got that information from uh, Mac McGrew's uh, American Metal Typeface of the 20th century. By the way, Copper Plate Gothic um, was, according to Mac McGrew, was ATF's all time bestseller. OK, well, back to uh, Turin. Here we have uh, a very extraordinary um, piece of uh, technical virtuosity. Um, besides the six point variations of letter size and the micro name, microgramma, of course, that gives uh, gives away something. This is an exploit of the of the foundry's mechanical cutting um, of the Ave Maria on a piece of type metal six by nine millimeters. Uh, which they were also able to print and people were able to read, apparently. I've never actually seen it, but this is an enlargement of it here. Uh, and uh, it does give you an idea of the main use of this type in very small sizes, mostly for stationery. Um, Nebbiello was very proud of this uh, uh, technical achievement, the founder's technical achievement. It was this particular uh, idea was produced in 1949. And the company even sent um, a, um, a, a piece of this type cast in gold to Pope Pius XII. Um, well, not only m m micro, but also macro, as you see. Uh, this Nebbiola wood type specimen book, probably from the late 60s, shows big sizes of microgramma up to a whopping uh, 30 lines or about the equivalent of 360 points on the right. Uh, not many people know about uh, the wood type department uh, that Nebbiolo had running at least since the World War I. Uh, it was destroyed by Allied bombing uh, during the Second World War, but was quickly reestablished from scratch 
um, with ne nebula made pantographs and other machinery. And they produced several specimen books of their wood type. Well, here we are back to uh, micrograma, uh, metal micrograma. Uh, on the left, we have uh, Booty's rather charming decorative cover for a um, specimen leaflet promoting micrograma. And this is flanked by Novarese's designs for a Eurostyle or Aerostyle leaflet, uh, which is modern and simple. Um, and it's interesting to note this uh, subtitle here. Uh, a synthetic expression of our times. Um, as I said, me, no, I think I said it before, uh, Micrograma was released in 1952, Aerostele 10 years later in 1962, after um, Bouti had left and Novarese took over as director of the uh, Studio Artistico. Well, here we have the complete uh, five variants of uh, micro of uh, aerostile they are the same exactly the same five as um was released for uh as was cast for micrograma um later on um uh, much later on new new variants were added by nebbiolo uh but um uh, several new variants several more condensed versions were added um what we are particularly interesting interested in here is this one the uh, nera larga or the extra or the bold extended let's look at it closely here this is a what i call a quadrate grot uh, most of us know the subcategory of sans serif we call um, grotesques um, going reaching back to the 19th century uh, characterized by the terminals of certain letters curving towards the center and uh, we see that in uppercase and lowercase we see it here and we also see it here in the lowercase e which is blocking rather closing making a very tight aperture and the same in the s we see here upper and lowercase uh, one particularity here or a couple of particularities that are worth noticing here are a t with um a uh, um, a lower terminal, which is also reaching upwards towards the center. That's quite rare in sans serifs. And of course, this very wide branching of the R we see here, which causes a little bit of spacing problems uh, between it and the next letter. Um, these are the hallmarks of, uh, of, um, uh, of any grotesque, of course, this, this, what I've just mentioned here. But besides that, of course, the great contribution of uh, Aerostile was the introduction of lowercase letters for um, for this quadrate idea, this rectangle with rounded corners, which uh, we saw in micro microgramma. Um, the quadrate letter forms and their weighty flatness, I think, are the real hallmark, hallmarks of bold extended. And this is what we're going to be concentrating on uh, for, for a few minutes. Um, so the salient features are uh, exactly this, this, wi this uh, wide uh, rectangle with rounded corners or sometimes called a super ellipse. Um, I just couldn't resist the temptation to put in three contemporary illustrations here, um, almost randomly selected from a, a quite a considerable archive I've got of uh, Aerostile in use today. Uh, this heavily metallized plastic 3D sign on the top left nicely shows off what I like to call the heavy metal quality of bold extended. Then there's this um, this can this. Uh, uh, this uh, illuminated jeweler's sign, and here is a canister of polyphosphate powder brought to my kitchen by a plumber just last week uh, to reduce calcium carbonate in my boiler. Um, this is a photograph which I'm very fond of. Uh, it shows Novarese with his friend Luigi Maletto, who chalked up 90 years of age uh, in autumn last year. Uh, just after Novarese had uh, been presenting his um, his Eurostyle, uh, his Aerostyle here, uh, I think this is the um, the uh, uh, bold extended version as well. Um, 1962 at the Rencontre de Lourdes, 
in southern France. Uh, the two placards at the bottom here uh, are uh, on the left of these two placards. We see we can just decipher a coach of a train here uh, with windows. And we'll look at that right now. Um, Nova, what, 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 just in a minute, Novarese was very lucky to find out exactly what he wanted to do in his life. At the age of 16, he entered the, um, he was buttonholed by Booty, who taught at the Paravia school in Turin, and Booty brought him into Nebbiolo. And from that age on, he, he started his career and he went on until 1973 when he left Nebbiolo, shortly before it, the uh, company collapsed. Uh, and uh, set up on his own as a, a freelance type designer, uh, completely renewing him, renewing his uh, uh, his uh, um, his work, and became very successful too as a freelancer. So he had a successful career as um, director of the Studio Artistico from nineteen from nineteen fifty two when Booty left, right up until uh, he left in nineteen seventy three. Um, here is the detail I mentioned before from, um, from the 2020 edition, a new edition of Novarese's Alpha Beta, which was first published in Turin in 1964. Uh, you can see the train carriage with the super ellipsed windows uh, and a television screen. Um, it's, I think it's the most intriguing and credible expression of typographic zeitgeist that I've ever, ever seen. The train windows and the television screen with the Eurostyle O uh, on the right show the super ellipsis, uh, the rectangle with the rounded corners I mentioned earlier. Um, Eurost Eurostyle was presented by Novarese on Italian state television. I oh, know, that's, that's fake news. Um, I, I had that photoshopped by my friend and um, for Fabrizio Falcone simply because I liked the idea so much of the comparison with of Eurostila with uh, a television screen. Um, but even nicer, in my opinion, is this photograph of Sophia Loren uh, holding up a tin of marinated eels. Don't look at her armpits. Just notice the super elliptical, elliptical shape of the tin. Uh, another um, a nice comparison to my mind was the um, was the idea of bold expe bold extended uh, compared with a heavy with a link of the heavy iron chain of a dreadnought. Here, a link seems to have broken uh, in two and is dropping down to the bottom of the sea. But if we look at this here, we're going to see how these parentheses uh, were used first by Micrograma and uh, Aristile uppercase. Um, rather ungainly brackets, I would say. Uh, we see those two exact, exactly same um, parentheses on the lowercase bold extended here. Uh, they just seem to have been taken straight away from, um, from Microgrammar without any uh, adaption at all. They look far too heavy and it seems Novarese um, just took them, took them from micro, Microgrammar without any thought. Uh, I think uh, it's worthwhile taking a lesson from Renaissance typography for an instant, just to see how Aldus Manusius treated his parenthesis in the De Etna 1496, which I suppose many of you, most of you will know about. His and Jensen's parenthesis too are much lighter than the surrounding type and works much, work, uh, the surrounding Roman type. And to my mind, they work much, much, much better. Um, look at this weird sentence read it if you want in uppercase helvetica bold extended caps sorry that's another fake news it's not helvetica it's aerostile bold extended caps and there's only one letter with rounded corners here the g um that the the, the, the the sentence i chose this sentence simply because uh there were no other rounded corners in the letters that I chose. It's completely artificial. Uh, there are, in fact, only 11 uppercase letters with uh, rounded parts in any alphabet. Um, but normally, even short sentences in the Aerostile caps have a few rounded letters, and recognition is not normally difficult. Uh, with 18 rounded letters in the lowercase of here, your Aerostile bold extended, uh, 
is instantly recognizable in any any combination of letters for any sentence uh, just changing the subject a bit i want to show what happened to aerostile bold extended after the closure of Nebol, nebbiola and the demise of letters le, uh, of letterpress as a, as the uh, technique as a, his, uh, no longer commercially viable uh, here we have uh, an example of transfer lettering, which was invented by Letter Set in the 1960s and became hugely popular, especially in small design studios during the interregnum from the end of commercial letterpress to the dawn of digital type from the late 60s right up to the end of the late 80s. Uh, Letter Set's rival, Mechanorma, sold its plastic sheets of Aerostile Bold Extended in 16 sizes, up to 48 millimeters is the largest size. Uh, that means more than 100 points. Letraset also sold its sheets of Aerostile Bold Extended in many sizes. And I think this, this, um, the, the number of um, different sizes sold uh, in, this, um, in these transfer lettering sheets certainly testifies to the popularity of uh, Aerostile Bold Extended. Um, later, of course, photo lettering was the other technology, well, later at the same time, photo lettering uh, in the 70s and 80s in particular was the other technology that together with offset replaced uh, letterpress. Photo lettering studios uh, offering their services to advertisers, publishers and designers mushroomed in all of Europe's big cities. And here are two pages from, of Aerostile uh, from the Milan company Actual Types specimen book. And notice the Aerostile italic, which was, had been absent uh, in all of the uh, specimens I've shown so far. Nebbiolo, uh, either, both in microgrammar and in Aerostile, never had an italic. Uh, I think it was Linotype, uh, digital Linotype, that first produced the digital version of Aerostile in the early 1980s. They had 11 variants with, uh, of course, with the added um, at sign and a few other glyphs. Um, here's a synthesis of Akira Kobayashi's Aerostile Next, or Eurostyle Next, I suppose would be the right pronunciation here. Five weights, each in extended, normal, and condensed versions. Uh, Kobayashi resisted the temptation to make italics, and it was released by uh, Linotype um, in 2007. Uh, there must have been good news coming from Linotype's sales office because um, uh, they, this, the de further developments of Aerostele Next uh, came onto the scene in 2016 under Terence Wienzel's uh, supervision. Linotype came up with a grand brigade of 50 variants, but this time including italics. Uh, certainly, our bold extended might have lost its commission as field marshal in the Grand Army of San Serifs but uh he would still retain importance as a high-ranking officer in the aerostele next brigade that we see here um let's now look at some of the early precedents to microgrammar and aerostele here we see three of the four here in the upper part we see three of the four weights of benton's bank gothic 1930 to 1903 were the years in which it was uh, released a caps only quadrate face we can be pretty sure that Booty must have had ATF specimens of, of this face in his studio. I think he was familiar with Bank Gothic before embarking on Microgramma. Evident, evident differences are in the figures. Uh, the rounded D we see here, uh, to avoid confusion with O in small sizes probably, the diagonally sheared uh, terminals in C, G and S, and also the 90 degree internal terminals, uh, internal angles that we see in the uh, in um, these letters here, O, Q, uh, C, D, etc. All of the rounded letters have internal uh, uh, 90 degree angles. Uh, Stationer's Gothic below is a new, uh, which came out in 1948 is even more similar to Microgramma. Um, it 
it has rounded internal corners, uh, but I doubt that the Studio Artistico had any knowledge of this um, uh, this specimen or specimens from the American monotype. And it's probable that Booty knew nothing about this, even though the similarity is quite impressive. Uh, actually, um, Michael Grammer was already designed uh, at this time, and by 1948, it hadn't been yet produced, but it was already completely designed, so I heard. Uh, what about this, the, these two examples from um, Michaela Smith's and Jordan, uh, taken from the Inland Printer here. Uh, black cap and giraffe. Uh, these are quadrate, ca uh, quadrate ca uh, caps, no lowercase in any of them. Um, they are uh, from an 1891 copy of the Inland Printer uh, and an interesting precedent of the quadrate idea for uh, Sanceris as well. Now, I first saw this page from a French lithographed lettering manual, which was reproduced in, uh, well, of 1852, which was reproduced in Michael Twyman's, Twyman's recent article in the current British uh, Printing His Historical Society journal. Uh, it shows three styles of shaded letters, including a Grecian here, uh, Londres or Londres. Um, just cut off the serifs here and round out the corners and you have a quadrate sans. Uh, the others, of course, are Egyptian and a sans serif here, which is almost quadrate looking at this O here. Uh, but what about another area that has nothing to do with printing at all? Uh, I mean, incised monumental, mon monumental lettering in quadrate sans. Uh, this is a photo from uh, inside Bristol Cathedral in England. And um, the date is 1841. Uh, letters O, D, and G are quadrate, uh, sufficiently quadrate for us to consider this as a quadrate sans, I would say. Uh, Lucia Perondi, thank you very much for having supplied this photograph. Uh, uh, about 10 years ago, I visited for the first time the Stalielo, Stalieno Cemetery in Genoa. And I came across this funerary inscription, and I immediately thought I'd found the original source of Microgramma and Aerostile. Uh, in, ingenuously, I, uh, I, that was my, my first thought on, look, on seeing this inscription. It's so similar. They're uncanny in their similarity to, um, to Microgramma and Aerostile. Uh, but they must have been cut 40 years before Microgramma was released. Uh, and that is quite extraordinary to my mind. Um, in the same cemetery, Stalieno, which is very famous for the uh, hyper for its hyper realistic sculptures, uh, we see here an angel escorting the soul of Rocco Piaggio to heaven. Uh, below, there's a relief inscription with his name. Uh, Piaggio was a shipping magnate and made a fortune out of making, taking millions of Italian immigrants from Genoa to such countries as the U USA and Argentina. Let's look, uh, take a more, a closer look at this inscription. Here it is. Uh, I haven't been able to go there since a long time ago, and I would like to go there and take more photographs of this. Um, it's a close up of the same inscription. The year of Piaggio's death is 1875, just uh, hidden by this lamp. Um, so, this inscription, also in relief quadrate letter, uh, uh, capitals, um, <clears throat> was made nearly 40 years before the previous one. Uh, and I would like to think that it was made by the same craftsman. And the previous inscription, which was more competent and the letters were um, better executed, uh, were probably the result of uh, the decades of experience between, uh, from this one um, done much earlier. Uh, I like to think it was the same craftsman. Uh, the similarities are very obvious. Um, but just like Aerostyle, bold, extended. These letters are so distinct. Uh, I've not seen them 
anywhere else in inscriptions just like that. There are many examples of quadrate letters in uh, various cemeteries, uh, but then none of them are anything similar to the uh, extended, the bold extended that we see here. Uh, and I'm want my curiosity to know uh, it, whether this style is to know whether this style was um, invented by the craftsman or the sculptor, whoever did this, these two inscriptions, or whether it was picked up from some lettering manual or some other source yet to be discovered. So if anyone, uh, any, any of you have any explanation of this mysterious uh, title of my talk, uh, or any explanation of this, uh, the origins of this particular style, uh, at least now you have an explanation of the mysterious title with which I started this talk. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, James. Thank you, everyone. Uh... We will take a few uh, minutes for some questions, um, maybe like 10, 15 minutes. There's, there's a number of questions in the Q&A and uh, a number of them kind of are addressed uh, across. Um, I'll try to do my best, but also if, if um, any of the panelists are, are seeing these questions, feel free to pluck them from, from the chat. But first of all, thank you so much for such an engaging, such an interesting like narrative uh, split uh, perfectly across uh, four, four presenters. So. Um, super, super interesting. It gave me so much more to think about Nebbiolo, one of my most most interesting, kind of most, most uh, curious founders to me. Um, let me see if, uh, if there's a good question. We can uh, start this off. Um, I guess there's a couple of um, questions that came up in terms of the, the earlier stuff. Um, maybe I can combine some questions. In um, the some of the early typefaces that were shown that were typefaces coming from other foundries, whether it was Nebbiolo or, or founders prior to them, how did they um, actually acquire, or how, like, was that through matrices, or or did they like, what was the process? If if one of you could speak to that, um, I can answer that probably it was a mix of everything. There are. Um, um, traces on Arte della Stampa that was um, a magazine published since the uh, second half of the 19th century about uh, even German type foundries suing Italian ones because they were copying typefaces without having the legal rights. Sometimes it was legal, sometimes they were inspired and just copying. It was a, a mix. We know that Nebbiolo had um, official legal tights with other uh, foundries, but we, it's, uh, it's hard to say for sure. Because also it was, uh, every foundry, foundry was copying each other. So establi establishing who had the original design, it's also difficult. You may find the same design or very similar across different foundries and finding which one actually sold or which one was copied by the Italian one, it's extremely complicated. Yeah, especially in that like 19th century where um, the forms are so expressive. It's uh, like where, where the first thing came first. Um, there's a kind of a related question that uh, Nick Sherman asked about um, the legal agreements with some companies. I mean, this is probably, you know, this is more about like the 70s, like um, in terms of uh, legal agreements with companies like Letraset or Photo Lettering to adapt their designs, so rather than like kind of Nebbiolo taking designs, it's like what was the the other way, especially for for Microgramma. Or... Well, since uh, since the company was acquired in 1976 by Fiat, the major auto automobile uh, co conglomerate. Uh, Fiat tried to uh, salvage whatever was possible, so they kept uh, the Nebbiolo printing presses factory afloat, but dismissed, closed down the letter foundry in 1978. And uh, what is more appalling is that they threw away, they dumped the whole archive. So there are no documents whatsoever. The only documents they kept were the employment um, files. 
These are the only extant documents we can access at the Fiat archive, unfortunately, which is still interesting, but there's nothing about matrices, drawings, the books, the specimens, all the catalogs, nothing. So we are mostly speculating and trying to find bits of evidence scattered here and there. Yeah, contemporary magazines, usually. We are using a lot contemporary magazines. Alessandro is taking many, many pictures. But yes, we just throw everything away. Makes, makes this research so much more hard, harder and uh, obviously more impressive the, the seeing what you've done uh, to, to piece this together. So it's uh, kind of incredible. Um, there was a question from Maxime. Maxime Zhukov asked if at any point in its history, did Nebbiola have a non-Latin program of any significance, Greek, Cyrillic, Arabic, Hebrew, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. it's something that uh, we have not a research, uh, Alessandro, sorry. It's something that we okay, just came, up, came out really recently and we haven't researched yet. Alessandro has photographed some int very interesting specimen. It seems that they had a market, especially in Middle East and with, and with Greek types. Alessandro, would you confirm you? Yes, we have at least uh, three Greek type, small Greek type specimens. Plus we have a couple of um, Oriental typefaces and scripts uh, specimens too, because uh, along with the printing presses, Nebbiolo was also selling typefaces. So they used to sell typefaces to the Middle East, to Ethiopia, to several countries in, uh, in Eastern Asia as well. So India and uh, Thailand and Japan as well, along with uh, printing presses. And plus we have uh, several um, Hebrew and rabbinic typefaces already in the early 1920s. We haven't studied them yet, roughly. We, we have only gathered uh, evidence and, and registered their, their existence, made reproductions, but so far we did, didn't have the time to delve into the matter. Mm -hmm. Those are very... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, Komoriti and Urania were also selling um, Greek and Cyrillic typefaces. Um, probably not their own design, but there was a market for those as well. Mm -hmm. uh, John Barry asked a, a quick follow-up if, if there was any Ethiopic typefaces. Yes, seen. yes, they did, they did. And um, from uh, uh, testimonies of former workers, former employees at the foundry, uh, they say that at least once a year, they had to cast new Ethiopian typefaces to be shipped to Ethiopia, a former, uh, a former Italian colony. Just, just, just remember that Italy conquered Ethiopia in 1936. So for just a few years, we were there, which explains the strong links between the two countries. And, um... In terms of Nebbiolo's present as a company, is it still an entity that exists in, in name and, and it, it's completely gone? Um, gone. It, it's completely dead. Mm -hmm. No one owns the right anymore. And I've, I've heard, and maybe this is something that, that I have um, heard incorrectly, but um, there was a division that was making like machinery, kind of heavier technology towards presses and, and actually presses, right? Like printing presses, yeah. did they? So did that continue or is that the division that Fiat was more interested in because of the heavy... Fiolo no. survived as a printing press manufacturer until the late 80s, early 90s. Um, as the years passed, uh, the company changed hands from Fiat. It was uh, sold to Cerruti, who was another manufacturer of printing presses here in Piemonte, and then uh, just another couple of times to a different um, company. And in the end, they were uh, just um, reducing the number of employees. So basically in the, in, in the last period, they were mainly um, making spare parts for the old rotary and offset press, presses in order to supply their customers abroad. There was a question, Bruce Kennett asked the question that uh, when he was at, um, at a press in the 1980s, uh, um, Antonsen Press, uh, they had a wonderful 
inch cylinder press with two badges, Nebbiolo and Mergenthaler. Uh, was Nebbiolo the agent distributor of EVOs? Uh, Nebbiolo presses, um, as I recall, the press was made in 1950. So was that possibly like a, 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 a Nebbiolo with line uh, with Mergenthaler producing kind of uh, presses in, in, in tandem? I don't know. Yeah, I wonder if that's like the, the press division. Um, there was a, a, a question about uh, kind of going back to, I think, Marta's uh, the beginning of the story. If, if there is biography, I mean, I think that this came up in terms of finding the, the information about some of these uh, individuals. Uh, is there biographies of uh, the founders, uh, Levy and Nebbiolo? Is, that, is there anything? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, the research is still ongoing, so there's a lot still to be discovered. What is interesting is that uh, Giovanni Nebbiolo actually left pretty early um, and uh, just left his name on the type foundry and died in 1925, a farmer in Montgolieri near Turin. Nothing to do with type or metal for almost three decades. Um, that is a, the only curious bit about their life. And uh, James uh, had shared uh, the Nebbiolo, which I had seen images of the, the little kind of uh, piece I have in the collection. This, uh, this is a small piece that was made by Haas. Um, much later, I think it's probably from, I mean, maybe the 50s, but uh, it, it actually has the sort of the, the very similar principle. I mean, it's in, you know, tiny, obviously, so you can imagine the scale that yeah. what James Absolutely. was talking about. It's, yeah. Have you actually tried to print it? I have not. No, I'm very, yeah. very precious with this piece. But if you <laughs> if you put a loop to it, yeah. um, that's basically what you're seeing there. And that's yeah, kind of like the actual size too. Yeah, um, absolutely extraordinary. Um, uh, Talone, uh, Enrico Talona, who's been so helpful to all of us, um, said that this had, that this uh, um, very tiny, um type of aerostele er, er, was uh, was made in uh, 1949 um uh, and one other thing i would like to say about talone is thank to him that uh, um he, he purchased at the end of the uh, nebbiolo story he was able to purchase uh, a great quantity of specimen books that ne nebbiolo had uh, and that was lucky otherwise they would have would have been thrown away with, with the rest of the archives. Uh, and uh, fortunately, he's allowing us to um, to see these and photograph them. And not only, not only he not only has uh, specimen books, but of course, as Alessandro mentioned, lots of other uh, documents and material too. Mm -hmm. And is, is, um, is the bulk of the material kind of spread out? Um, that you're all researching from. I mean, I imagine it's like in several, many, in many places. Is it is it kind of in public hands and in collections? Is it private hands? Like it's it's. I imagine it's a mix. But is there a particular place where mo most of this material is available? Uh, well, there's the Tipoteca, uh, uh, which is perhaps one, certainly one of Europe's greatest printing museums, and uh, I hope you'll all be able to get there sooner or later in northeastern Italy. Uh, and they have a big collection of, uh, of Nebbiolo material, Nebbiolo 20th century typefaces, uh, and, um, and as well as specimen books and magazines and uh, um, from all periods of the 20th century. So that together with Talone, I think are perhaps the major sources for our research. Um, as I said, it would be great if people listening to this talk that have material from all the foundries that were mentioned will get in touch because as you were saying, a lot of material is scattered around and it's very hard even to map um, how many specimens existed, uh, where they are. Um, a lot of material is, there's not a lot, but there's some uh, in the special collection at Columbia in New York uh, and other specimens spread here and there. So um, be in touch. 
And if there is the um, resources available in Turin, like um, Archivi Typographico, is that like, um, is, is that a collection that-, that oh, yes. Is yes, I think we should mention Archivio Typographico as well. Uh, they are, um, they published, I don't know whether you see this. Can you see this? Yeah. Yeah, this is the, uh, the latest edition published in 2020, or uh, beautifully printed by Grafica Antigua. Uh, of um, the, it's a facsimile of the first edition of uh, Alphabeta, uh, and they have also have a lot of material, and have also been um, been helpful to me. And I've been kind of going through our collection. I, I don't know if anyone is familiar with this. The, oh, I've been trying yeah. to figure out like what what yeah, uh, Novarese is. This was new to me. Yeah, I I I uh, I used mixage uh, letter set mixage I think in uh, in the 1980s uh, and it's, I think it's one of mm, one of uh, Novarese's most um, most interesting typefaces a very interesting sans serif uh, which I I used to actually for my for my visiting, my personal visiting card uh, the classic ITC, but this was new. I've been going through the ITC uh, uh, collections, of course. The, yeah, of course, Novarese um, reinvented himself after he left Nebbiola, as I said, uh, and uh, his first typeface was called uh, Fenice, Phoenix, which is uh, a very apt name for his new typeface. There it is, Fenice, ITC Fenice. Um, the Phoenix, uh, uh, um, born again from uh, from its ashes just like uh, the ashes of the nebbiolo there was Novarese again uh starting up from scratch on his own yeah uh, i was actually uh curious to, to to know i mean maybe this is a good point to, as, as we wrap up but what um what is the what's the plan for um the the, the this project that you're all working on, like what's the, what's sort of the, like what's the next step? What can we keep an eye on? Cause I'm, I'm super interested in keeping tabs on, on this evolution. Well, we are organizing a conference in Turin for September and uh, we will give the details quite soon. We are organizing right now and there will be um, publication after the conference with the uh, um, articles made of the um, talks, maybe out of the talks, so the proceeding of the conference. And um, it will be in presence if we're able to, and it will be online. So we will give uh, information about it. And it will be a collection of, uh, I mean, the four of us, a, a other friends and colleagues who are collaborating with us, and then we invited uh, many scholars from Italy and abroad, trying to cover several aspects of the viola. So. Great. Okay. I think because this, this has sort of been my my only resource. Uh, it's quite, quite short, but quite, quite dense in terms of the, the leads, but I would love to fill out my, my yes. knowledge of Italian foundries. Yes, uh, it's very dense. It's a very good book, but you know, it was written 30 years ago. So it, it's time to update it. But it was very good and very important. I mean, all of us started our researches out of this book. Very important in Italy. Well, here's, here's to sort of the, the expanded. I look forward to, to, the, to the conference in September. Um, Alessandro posted the date, September 10th and 11th. So uh, for folks watching, um, you know, keep an eye on that uh, and keep an eye on the evolution of this project. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's so wonderful to see this research and it's wonderful to see the work, how rich and vibrant the, everything is and how amazing the, the history is. And it's wonderful to see all the names mentioned, uh, which is to me one of the most important pieces of history is like, you know, not just like the visual material, but of course the, the people behind that material to know their names, to, to, to to know a little bit more about them, like really reconnects us to, to the history of the of, of, of typography and to our, our, our um, design path. So thank you so much to, to everyone joining us. Thank you to, to our panelists. Thank you, uh, James. Thank, thank you, Marta. Thank you, Alessandro. Uh, thank you, Ricardo. We hope to see you all soon. Uh, uh, thank you for coming today. Um, keep an eye for the video. It'll be, it'll be record, uh, posted in a couple of weeks. Uh, you can also catch it on the YouTube. The stream should stay up.
if you wanted to, to catch any of the images or grab any of the information that's there. But have a wonderful evening, everyone. Uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so for having us. Thank you to Cooper Thank Union you. for hosting Thank us. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. And thank you to all, um, all the um, the attendees, virtual attendees. Yes. Thank you very much.